My name is Alexander Hagen. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist. I was also a research engineer in telecommunications. I'm presently the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. And I'd like to report tonight on the uh, events that have occurred since Donald Trump became president in my last report in. My last report in dealt with my displeasure at the uh, certain elements of society calling for intervention by the deep state, uh, including uh, one of the fathers of neoconservatism. Uh, I think it was uh, Crystal, who said that uh, he'd rather have the deep state than the Trump state. And um, then there's some confusion about the term deep state. People started to use it very uh, casually. The deep state <clears throat> presupposes that there's a criminal conspiracy. Uh, it isn't enough that it's simply people deep in government. Uh, in my view, the deep state is this system that is looking to thwart constitutional law, uh, and the permanent bureaucracy is a given, and it doesn't need a title like the deep state. It doesn't mean the top people talking amongst themselves in the permanent bureaucracy. Something much more serious than that. Uh, so, um, so you can forgive some people for calling the so-called deep state if they don't understand what it is they're calling. And then you have to wonder about others, professionals in the press, who would call for such a thing, or a man like uh, Crystal. So, uh, what I warned of in my last uh, talk was that the people being ousted from the Trump core were the outsiders, and I was prescient enough because, in fact, McMaster coming in, H.R. McMaster exactly fulfilled the prophecy I made, which is that he would be ideologically purified towards the Washington consensus. So we had uh, Flynn, who uh, does, uh, was uh, uh, favorable towards Russia uh, compared to the current uh, insanity, which I pr frankly prefer uh, Flynn to McMaster, who is uh, doing exactly what he said he uh, talked about in his strategy lectures that are available on YouTube. So H.R. McMaster would have been a perfectly good and say uh, national security advisor to Clinton just as much as he is to Trump. Um, so that was my compliment, Mr. McMaster. But his strategy is essentially to make uh, is to make sure that the regional powers are not free to roam, that they're hemmed in. And this is exactly what we see with what he has always talked about is bringing the scrimmage line right up in their face. So he's going to bring the scrimmage line right up in the face in the Ukraine, in the Baltic, in North Korea. He is bringing the U.S. Uh, scrimmage line as close to the, uh, what he perceives as enemy as possible, thinking mistakenly this will pin the enemy down. What he'll actually do is provoke an arms race and a possible accidental uh, major nuclear war. Uh, this is not what we want <clears throat> uh, because it isn't about a risk game. It's about all of us surviving on this planet. Now, uh, since I last reported in, there was a crisis in Syria where a rocket uh, attack, apparently, or bombing attack, uh, was involved. The Syrian government was operating, occurred around the same time as a chemical uh, release, uh, and uh, my man, Mr. Bernie Sanders there, unfortunately, came out and said uh, that, uh, you know, basically Assad's a monster who's killed most of his people and needs to go. Um, and there's an excellent piece by Scott Ritter before the election where he describes all these problems of Bernie in Libya voting and with the sense of Congress to move forward with an intervention there. Uh, however, uh, Bernie always spoke of... Uh, he never got under the wheels of the military industrial complex trained directly. So he would uh, not let them isolate him on these issues. He would stick with the group, but he would push them towards uh, a more comprehensive and sober uh, audience, such as the United Nations. Do Libya through the United Nations. And um, so we can only hope that Bernie would have done better at his point. Uh, was that Bernie, when it came down to it, did vote for the peace with Iran. Um, what Scott Ritter, the former uh, U.S. weapons inspector, stated uh, was that this shows that 
if it, there's a survivable, politically survivable uh, way to advocate peace, Bernie will go with it. But uh, uh, he didn't have the uh, spine that Chelsea Gabbard has displayed. Tulsi Gabbard has displayed one has to ask why. Because I can't believe in his heart of hearts he actually thinks all of this to be so. He plays it much more centrist figure in foreign policy. And we can only assume that that's because he does not want to spark a war with a military industrial complex when what he's really after is a increase in the lower and middle class standard of living uh, along with uh, various sensible policies to get more resources into the hands of the poor and middle class and out of the oligarchy. Uh, this is uh, so, in the case of Assad using chemical weapons in Idlib, so there's a guy named Theodore Postol, P-O-S-T-O-L, and he's an MIT professor who specializes in, like, uh, rocketry. You know, he's into physics, he's into thermodynamics and uh, uh, structural analysis of aviation objects, and he looked at the photos that came out of the so-called crater with a rocket on them. And it was clearly a prop to anybody who was listening to him for a minute because the rocket is crushed on its side and the crater is not the type probably that would even be produced by this. But what they, if that was their evidence, as he said, it would disprove the uh, rebel case because it would show that somebody had put a, an explosive device, put the rocket on the ground with an explosive device next to it and then detonated it because it was crushed in and that's not how, under any circumstances, these devices uh, uh, react on impact. So, uh, uh, you know, Theodore Postol was waved off. And after all of these uh, uh, interventions where we constantly trot out the same series of lines and the same series of actions, so, and Ritter, again, I'll post him in the bottom of this, does an excellent job of describing this. In Libya, for example, uh, we follow the Iraq uh, playbook uh, to a large extent, which is accusing uh, uh, Gaddafi of weapons of mass destruction, uh, saying that he is a brutal dictator, saying that he has to go. All of a sudden, it becomes a sudden urgency. And, um, and the country ends up, uh, uh, as Obama said, a shit show. And um, this is uh, Obama's shit show. And um, he certainly should, instead of hanging out in the Caribbean with Richard Branson and going... Uh, to a four hundred thousand dollars speech, he should go to, uh, you know, Tunisia and broker an accord for Libya or something. Uh, so uh, that was Theodore Postol's work, and um, just as in the Russia hacks uh, and the Russia meddling. So uh, let's talk about that. So it's interesting how there's all of these phrases in propaganda propped out, uh, such as meddling, Russian meddling. So uh, you know. The last, uh, there, if you go on to Google and type in U.S. military in interventions, uh, you will get a list a hundred long. Uh, U.S. electoral interventions, I started making my own list, which I'll try to recall to post in the footnotes here. But uh, we intervened in the Australia election in 75 and uh, roughly 73 because the guy was against Vietnam. Uh, he was a Bernie Sanders-like figure. And the thing is, when we intervene and get rid of these people, they're often the one hope of maybe two or three generations in these countries, like Salvador Allende, Patrice Lumumba. These men do not come along every day. They come along every 50 years. And then not only are they not facilitated in creating these great positive changes in a country that brings more power into the hands of the poor and the middle class, uh, and a possibly less war, uh, because they're not willing to be on the end of the U.S. or whoever their enemy's yo-yo is. Uh, uh, instead, the country is severely punished, brutalized. Uh, so, you know, in the case of Chile, which is where my wife is from, I mean, women had horrible things done to them there. Uh, they tens of thousands. So Chile only had a population of 15 million. Of those, 3,000 died. So here in the U.S., you know, that would be like 6,000 dead in California and maybe 50,000 tortured in California. So it would more or less affect everybody. And Chile is really Santiago, the capital, and a lot of these people came from the capital, but their death was spread all over the country. And in the case of the Congo, there's been terrible endemic, uh, chronic warfare there. Um, 
and um, we intervened in the uh, you know elections all over the world every day. And you never see any articles saying U.S. meddling. Uh, so, so what elections have we meddled in recently? Um, so there, uh, you know, I think that the main example used is the spying on Merkel and the incredible amount of espionage over U.S. allies. And what you're seeing is uh, largely a wave of conservatism. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, the people in Greece were, uh, were really uh, decimated by their attempt to negotiate with the European Central Bank. Uh, and then here uh, in France, we have Macron now elected. Uh, Macron uh, has been called a creation of uh, central bankers, uh, almost a paper man. Uh, so it's it's uh, deeply disheartening. From what the criticism I've heard of him has not uh, been at all favorable. Shows him to be an utter centrist. Uh, but um, he's elected now. We have to hope that uh, he has some uh, French uh, spirit uh, and won't just sell his people out. Because you can do anything well and anything badly. You can be a centrist neoliberal and make uh, you know uh, improvements in people's lives by being an efficient, effective, honest administrator or being lucky, uh, like in the case of Bill Clinton, maybe a little bit of both. Uh, Although, you know, he ended up sowing the seeds for catastrophe with the Commodities Modernization Act and the Telecom Deregulation Act. So it, uh, it appears more likely that this attack in, in uh, Syria was a false flag. Uh, it's like, severely disappointing that our media is able to speak sanctimoniously without evidence. In the case of the Russian meddling in our election, it's a height of hypocrisy not to at least have some self-reflection of do the U.S. has meddled in every country's affairs repeatedly. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, so it's, and it's interesting to me that the word is now meddling. So what does, you see, the nice thing with the word meddling is it's not actually illegal. So you could, any Russian involvement, any drawing towards the Russian sphere of influence with the word meddling, you can criticize it because... Uh, if uh, it, it also denigrates them in a uh, power relationship because uh, a the stronger player never meddles. The stronger player dictates. It's always one of the uh, middle or weaker players who could be accused of meddling. So the U.S. has somebody by the throat and they're strangling him and Russia comes in and tries to pry one hand loose and we call it meddling. Um, my name is Alexander Hagen. Good night and good luck.